This is Marketing Jam, a show featuring the brightest minds in marketing. Brought to you by Canada Post. Head to canadapost.ca forward slash insight podcast for ideas to add value to your marketing. All right, I want to welcome everyone to the next episode of Marketing Jam. And this one's very special because um, we actually have one of my favorite uh, brands on the show. And uh, I've been drinking their brand, following their brand for a long time. And so it is a huge privilege to have them on the show. And just a little audio here for you. See what that's like. Oh, there's a little bit of fizz. I'm just cracking open right now. Those that are um, listening right now, I've just cracked open a new fresh bottle of healthy hooch kombucha. I have the pear ginger. Uh, style right here. This was actually the first kombucha I ever drank. So you always remember your first. Uh, I had their brand, which was Foundation, which was a flavorless one. And it was amazing. And it kind of was my first kind of introduction to the world of kombucha. And um, I haven't gone back since. And I continue to try other flavors and try other brands, but I always end up coming back to Healthy Hooch um, because it's awesome. So thank you so much for being on the show. It's a real honor to have you here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, happy to take part. So, origin story. Every superhero has one. Uh, how did Healthy Hooch begin? Well, I wouldn't say that we're superheroes, but I mean, we were racing in California and Will was sort of in his last year. So he was retiring that year and I hadn't decided what I was doing. Like you kind of take it year by year, but we were kind of playing with different ideas um, as to what business we wanted to start when we retired. And uh, while we and saw this from bike racing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and road bike racing, right? Not mountain bike. Yeah. Well, well, it I, used to be. I grew up mountain bike racing as a kid in Whistler, but made the switch to road. It's a little bit of a bigger world, more of a professional sport. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we were just sort of mulling over ideas as to what we wanted to do. And we loved kombucha. We were seeing it all over the States. And I mean, we saw it at a 7-Eleven like 10 years ago in Oregon. And at that point, I was like, wow, why isn't kombucha in Canada yet? And that's sort of where the seed was planted. And then three and a half years ago, we were like sitting, just recovering from a long, hard day. And I was like, wow, we should we should call it healthy hooch, healthy hooch kombucha. And of course, it was just an idea at that point, but I uh, started to research and we'll start to do a lot more research on how to actually produce it. And here we are today. Yeah, we spent that, that last year racing bikes. Um... Pretty much every minute not training, we were researching every inch of the internet. And I think after a year of solid work like that, we got to the point where I thought, holy smokes, I'm reading this article and I realized I've read this before. This was like eight months ago and I think I've read the internet. I've read everything about carbonation, <laughs> about fermentation, about equipment. We researched it all. That's amazing. So question for you, in the last kind of trending, how would you describe the kind of trend of kombucha? Like I know that you know, years ago, it was only your kind of like hippie friend or your really natural granola friend that ever drank it. And, and they always had that weird scoby looking thing on their counter. Um, but what happened? Why do I go into every grocery store now and see kombucha everywhere? Why is it in 7-Eleven now? I think, well, that was like, I don't know, 10 years ago now that we saw it in 7-Eleven. I think this started in Oregon, this, in Oregon. like this started so right much, here. yeah, so much earlier in the States. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, five years ago, you saw people making it at home. And then all of a sudden, these brands from the States started to come over to Canada. And then you started to get more Canadian companies. So that sort of, I mean, it's the West Coast. It's always influencing, well, anything from California is sort of like trending down to BC. So that's where you see it. Okay. okay. So and keep, keep, well, basically, if it's happening in California, it's probably going to happen in Canada or in BC pretty quickly. Yeah, give it, what, two, three, four years before you start seeing it I'd, come up? I'd say five years. Yeah, three to it five seems, seems like more like years. it. It's, it's surprising, actually, we're a little slower to adopt than we would expect. Like, you go to find something that's mainstream in a Safeway in Washington now or in Oregon, and especially in California, and it's like, wow, it's still not even really found in B.C. You think we're on the West Coast, we're looking for organic natural products, but we're slower to adopt than you would expect. Well, and that's that's also the difference is for some reason in the States, they are so much more open to new products, natural products, organic project products. It's like there's a, dem a, a bigger demand for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. Yeah. You know. I mean, a larger market for sure in a concentrated area. If you're mm -hmm. looking at L.A. or the Bay Area, of course, it's the market's pretty much the size of Canada. So, <laughs> yeah. 
So if we look at kombucha and those that have never drank in it, uh, are scared of it, um, maybe had a bad experience with it at one point, uh, why is it good for you? What, what's in it? What, what is in this bottle here that kind of is going to change my body? I mean, a lot of people have a bad experience and they say, I mean, we feel that question every day. Oh, I tried kombucha. It was gross. I don't like it. And then we ask, well, where'd you try it? Oh, it was my you know, sister-in-law made it at home in the basement. We're like, <laughs> well, we've all tried someone's homemade wine and it's, you know, vinegar. Uh, yeah. We tried someone's homemade beer and it has no carbonation. It's totally flat and has a bunch yeah. of yeast floating around. You think, well, yeah, well, of course it's no good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no and surprise. like nine, I'd say nine out of 10 home brews aren't going to be the best. But the thing about kombucha is it is so good for you. If it's raw, if it's unpasteurized, you're getting a ton of probiotics. Now, what comes along with the probiotics is up to who makes it. So it can be really high in sugar. It can be super vinegary. It can be really bitter. So there is an art to making kombucha healthy for one and delicious. Cool. And so probiotics is the main, is it the main kind of health component that we're all kind of adopting right now? Yes, it's probiotics and digestive enzymes. And I would also say the fact that it's a low sugar option. So that's, that's another thing that made it kind of an easy uh, sell to, uh, to move into the mainstream is that you can replace, um, you know, sugary pops, but you still have a nice tasty carbonated drink that's comparable social drink, but a fraction of the sugar. Well, and that's not across the board with all brands, but sure. for the most part, I'd say that there is less sugar in a kombucha than there is in pop or juice. So I should still check the so I'm looking right now at the sugar content here, four grams of sugar in the one I hold in my hand at the moment. And but you're saying it ranges all the way up to like 30, 40 grams, would you say, or is it stay within Not the as high as that, but it certainly ranges over twenty with some brands. Yeah. 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 All right. So but it's better than I mean, it's better than any other beverage you're gonna go for, in my opinion. Especially if it's raw. Okay. And tell me about this trend. I saw recently someone did a uh, hard kombucha. So it was an alkali alkalized kombucha. Are they included? Tell me what your thoughts are on that. I mean, how many, when we were in California last year in February, we drank about five or six alcoholic kombucha brands. We were visiting my uncle and we went and sampled everything that was out there. We really did a lot of research on that. We were interested. Mm -hmm. we didn't have that many that tasted as good as we were hoping. Okay. Yeah, the, that was kind of the disappointing part about the al alkalized kombucha is it, it doesn't have the best flavor. And that's because you're, I mean, it's just like fermenting anything, really. It's also an acquired, a more acquired taste, in my opinion. Um, whether that's going to change as brands come up. But I think it's a great idea. I think it's just another option. I mean, all of these canned uh, carbonated alcoholic beverages are so popular right now. So why wouldn't kombucha be a part of that category? Yeah. And I mean, I would say with a lot of those too, like people are jumping on it because it's convenient. Um, it's lower sugar, but many of the vodka sodas, the taste profile really isn't that great either, in my opinion. I think it's not, it's like a lot of these things. It's a blend of art and science. So the science part, you, know, you can hire someone who can follow specific parameters and make a consistent product. But is it, you know, as tasty as it could be? Well, that comes down to like a fine wine. Like someone with a lot of experience can really manipulate it and zero in on something that's delicious and it's a win-win mm -hmm. easier said than done <laughs> yeah and there are a lot of things like making an alcoholic product is not the same as making a non-alcoholic product there are just so many more licensing issues that you need your facility has to be licensed in a certain way it can't be made with other products so there are limiters to just being a kombucha company and then deciding that you want to make it an alcoholic kombucha so For sure i think everybody would be doing it if it was easy <laughs> yeah <laughs> So from a, a marketing standpoint, I go into my local grocer and there's all sorts of kombucha brands to choose from. Some that are shiny looking and rainbow looking and, you know, giving me all sorts of claims. It'll take me to another level of heaven if I drink it. So how have you managed to stand out amongst all these brands? That's definitely your department. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just, you know, designed a logo that I liked and that for me resonated that it's clean and simple and true to what it is and you know we want to be transparent so that comes across in our branding and in our product we're certified organic not all companies are and i think that if you are going to claim to be organic there has to be some accountability for the consumer so that's why we've decided to go the extra mile and be a certified organic kombucha that's awesome so when people look they have the choice and so it's the brand and the look and the feel, and then ideally it's people that notice your uh, insignia being organic. Yeah, and it's not it's not just that. Like you got to look on the label, you got to see who it's certified by, and, and as a consumer, you have to do your research. 
I mean, that's just what it comes down to. See who the certifying body is. See if they're, I mean, see if they're legitimate and people are actually going through the yeah. right uh, avenues. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, for us, we're at an interesting point as well because we did take a product-oriented approach. Like, we really did well in generating repeat customers because once they tried it, they realized, like, the actual product in this model is premium. Like, this is fantastic. Um, but that's now, as, we, as the business has grown, you realize, okay, we have to put more energy into marketing and educate consumers and actually get them to, to try it for that first time. Um, so that's that's kind of that current um, challenge, and that's where we're starting to put a little bit more energy. All right. And who are you finding is drinking kombucha these days? Kind of who's your target audience? Um, it's more broad than you'd anticipate. Yeah. Out of the <clears throat> blocks, I mean, everyone kind of focuses on that, you know, mid twenties to mid thirties female that does yoga, sort of active. <laughs> and that's that was like that's the kombucha consumer. And then we realize, like, you know, your brother, he's how old? Thirty two high steel worker, big burly construction worker guy, and coworkers are pulling our bottle of kombucha out of their lunch pail. Yeah. That was pretty exciting to that hear, was actually, really cool. when he told us that story. He's like, yeah, I was at work the other day, and one of my coworkers pulled out your bottle of kombucha, and was like, this stuff's amazing. He was like, I know the people who make that. <laughs> well, that is cool. And now tell me, you, you've you expanded to outside of just Healthy Hooch. Tell me about your new brand. Yes, we uh, uh, we made a basically a functional iced tea. And it's, it has a lot of functions, actually. It's sugar-free, calorie-free, and it's full of these adaptogenic herbs, so these herbs that sort of help you adapt to stress. Um, and this product isn't uncommon in the States. Like, there are a few brands doing it in the States. So for Canada, this is very innovative, but it's not completely new um, in the world of beverages. Okay. Um, but it's delicious. It's it's a nice iced tea. It's lightly sweetened, and it's got a ton of benefits for you. So I'm gonna have a little one right here. <laughs> here it is. You can take a look. So yeah. So you went with the white label, black on white, and kind of a nice artistic look and feel. Yeah. I well, like that. For this, we had we had like an artist draw out the herbs. Like I had in my mind like what I what I wanted. I wanted sort of. I wanted to go back to like the 1800s when people yeah. would have been looking for these herbs. They would have been drawing these herbs and right. then writing down the benefits. And that's kind of the marketing that I went for this brand. Yeah, and it's different. It's elegant. It's yeah. I don't know. It was fun to to make this product. To be honest, that that's cool. What's that term called? The old apothecary? Is that what they call it? The old like? Yeah, very similar. They're all pencil drawn. Yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. So when, when you held up the bottle, yours says detox on it. So it's every different kind of label have a different feeling or what you need in your life. And then those herbs will do that for you. Yes. Okay. What are the options we have currently? What are the different emotions or the fixes you have for people? <laughs> so uh, right now we actually are coming out with five flavors mm -hmm. and we're launching with Save on Foods in July, but there's a, um, a big chain in uh, out east that's taking it. But the five flavors we currently have it's going to be detox, yeah. stress, yeah, it's, yeah, needed, defense, yeah, calm. Wow. So depending on how you're feeling, you can almost get one of each and kind of have it in the fridge. You could go in there and be like, "Man, I'm feeling stressed. I'm going to grab one of these." Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, if you're a real purist and you really um, believe in the herbal benefits and you want to give it a try, you could potentially, you know, say, "I want to um, drink a detox daily for a week to ten days," type of thing. Right. And like the real power herb in there is milk thistle and you start to research these herbs and it gets really interesting. Like milk thistle is used even in more traditional mainstream medical settings for, um, let's say smoke inhalation. Um, mm -hmm. like we have forest fires in BC like crazy every summer now. Um, yeah. it actually helps your liver metabolize those, that particulate. So things that you're like, wow, this is really, it's really neat. So we got pretty deep into researching when we developed this. Well, and our, we have a friend that's a doctor and he said, yeah, we actually use milk thistle in a hospital setting, which is wow. a crazy thing to hear. Well, and for me, like I started using adaptogens because I was suffering from something called melasma and it's like an overpigmentation of the skin. So I, I researched a ton of different products and I couldn't find anything that worked and I didn't want to take anything toxic. So then I started researching different adaptogens that help with this condition that I had and I found that it really, really helped. So then sort of born the idea was the tea and kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. <laughs> so those that have never tried kombucha yet, what's kind of your uh, good entry? What's your introduction to kombucha? What should they try? You know, when should they have it and what should they expect to feel after they drink it? I mean, I think our brand is a good 
intro for a lot of people because it's not too vinegary. That's what often scares many people the first time. Like, whoa, this is like, whoa, overpowering. Oh, yeah. I've had those ones before. Yeah, you've had some of them are, yeah, they just kind of like a cough. slap in the face. <laughs> or there's so, a piece of phlegm still in the bottle and it's floating yeah. around and then you, it lands in your tongue and then you're like, oh, what did I, what, what's in there? <laughs> a lot of people have that story. They're in their car driving and they take that sip and there's a big chunk in their mouth. They think, what am I going to do? Like, I got to spit this out when I'm yeah. driving. <laughs> It's, and yeah, some brands choose to leave that in there. We filter yeah. that out. We yeah. thought it would be a little nicer to have a smooth. <laughs> well, and there's no there's no benefit to it. Like I always no. tell people, I'm like, the probiotics and digestive enzymes are microscopic. Like even with a coarse filter that's filtering out those massive scoby chunks, you're yeah. not you're not diminishing any of the probiotics. So, so there's no extra benefit for me drinking phlegm like substances in my drink. Okay. Not to our knowledge. <laughs> I mean, maybe it helps with a bit of digestion because it's kind of fibrous. Uh, I feel like that's a stretch. <laughs> yeah, it might be a stretch. <laughs> yeah. Personally, so it, and is it is it is it? Are, am I going to feel like a bit of a high or a caffeination, or is it like am I going to feel like my my digestive system gets rolling, or like after like I, I just drank a big thing of yogurt, like yop? I, you know, I think I. What we would always tell people is if you have a diet that doesn't have a lot of raw vegetables or yeah. vegetables in general, if you're a meat and potatoes kind of person, start with half a cup okay. because these have live probiotics. These have digestive enzymes. You're drinking something that is living. So if you have something new in your diet that you're not used to, you could have maybe a reaction. But people tend to not have a reaction with ours. We haven't had any, um, any complaints, to be honest, because it isn't as... I'd say vinegary. Mm -hmm. So I find sometimes the acidity can have an effect on your stomach. Yeah. Um, but really, if you have a varied diet, you're going to be absolutely fine. Right. Yeah, I mean, mostly it is lightly caffeinated. It'd be similar to, um, it's a little bit less than if it were just a cup of green tea. Yeah. Okay. So a little bit of stimulation that way. Like if you're sensitive to caffeine, you might notice it. If you drank a pile of coffee every day, you probably wouldn't really right. notice that level of caffeine. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it, it hits you a little more mild, like a like a green tea would, as opposed to coffee. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, and the B vitamins, it does it does have B vitamins in it, so those can also give you a little bit of energy. Okay. Nice. Some feel a little flush from B vitamins. Yeah. Okay. So when you um, kind of think about your brand and coming up in this next year and the, and the trends that are coming down, what are things that you're watching out for and that you're kind of keeping your pulse on to kind of say, okay, what's happening here and and things that you're excited about or watching or nervous about coming down the pipeline. I think everybody right now is nervous with obviously the current situation. Uh, how do you market to consumers when you can't do any in-store sampling? Uh, that's a big one for any sort of beverage brand in the grocery world, well, any food brand actually. Yeah. So yeah. How, do we, how do we get it to the consumer? How do we get consumers to try the product? So that yeah. is sort of the dilemma I think that a lot of companies are in right now. Mm. Um, things that are exciting in a time like this, people are normally more concerned with their health yeah during any recession people are normally thinking about their health a lot more because i mean they're not doing anything else yeah right yeah it, it's tough to see like we would normally promote through a lot of grassroots activities like farm markets or uh, concerts there's a beer fest we were going to do there's a bunch of things we have scheduled for this summer that of course are now canceled so and no in sampling like show said so yeah we have to figure out how to talk to the consumer directly um and also it could be people are looking at um maybe different purchasing methods, like instead of grabbing one drink as you're out and about going to meetings, and that kind of thing, you might grab a whole host of beverages like to stock up the fridge for the week because you don't hit yeah. the store frequently. So you purchase more per purchase, but less often. So how do you kind of consider that in your marketing? Um, yeah. It's a big consideration for this summer. Oh, yeah. Well, and especially if people aren't walking the aisles as much yeah. anymore. Exactly. And that's, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I've seen the trend, um, especially in the last kind of three years, of like the cold pressed juices, and then people subscribing to cold pressed juices, and they get like kits sent to them. Is it, I haven't seen it as much these days. Cold pressed juice still a thing? Like, are people still excited about that? Is that still a kind of a drink option? Because you don't see it in stores really, because they they kind of go bad so quickly. So it's you got to like privately order. Yeah, it does expire very quickly, so it's tough to put on the shelf in the store. Well, and it's it's a complicated business plan because you are selling direct to the consumer yeah. rather than going as a wholesaler, and you have to manage your inventory because, like you said, it doesn't last very long. 
So the amount of resources that you have to put into making the product batch by batch in such small batches, yeah. um, that is a bit of a limiting factor. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've talked about it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think it seems like where that's trended is more... Um, retail space. Yeah, more retail space, exactly. Yeah. So like you have basically like a little cafe, like a little juice bar, yeah. which you know was kind of a smoothie bar a few years yeah. ago. And now maybe yeah. it's turned into a little bit lower sugar, more you know, green juices and things in the cold press juice space. Yeah. But it's still tough to see it in the in the retail area because I think that is the, the distribution is the biggest issue. Yeah. yeah. Now, now for you guys, what would you say if someone was listening to the show, watching the show, and, and going to start their own drink brand? What's something that you wish someone had told you when you were getting your drink brands off the ground? <laughs> There's a lot of Don't do it. Things, yeah. <laughs> Don't produce your own product. Don't be <laughs> the manufacturer because there are so many – there are so many hurdles there there are just so many moving parts that have to work in like that have to be synchronized it it just it is a very complicated world when you are actually producing the product now if you're just marketing your product and you're formulating a recipe that's great that if you can focus on that then do it mm -hmm. um, however that is a larger initial investment than you would anticipate okay getting your stuff done through contract um you'll always get sticker shock in your fridge because you you know you go talk to a contract producer and it's like oh sure we can do that you know minimum maybe a small one be minimum ten thousand liters per flavor yeah so thousand bottles per flavor and you think oh my gosh that's like absolutely outrageous i could never do that um but alternatively when you start investing in equipment you yeah. start talking to microbiologists you start developing all these procedures yourself you're like whoa this is years of hard work <laughs> oh yeah it's it's a it's a big big investment in your time and and in your money to be honest yeah. Yeah. and that's what i hear all these uh kind of vodka sodas that have launched especially here in bc so many of them are contract i feel like it's not them producing it they've gone underneath another brewery or a distillery it's so it's many actually, brands on the shelf it's incredible now that we're further into this mm -hmm. like the, the volume of product in the grocery store shelf that is contract produced it's mm -hmm. incredible yeah and i mean we're starting to get to the point where we're doing that for others because we've kind of done these hard yards and built out <laughs> the capabilities. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. So I'm um, listening to the show. I'm in Canada. When can I see, like, will I see Healthy Hooch on all shelves across Canada and your new product? Will I see it on shelves across Canada or, or when can I expect it? Kombucha is hard. It's a cooler product. It has yep. to be refrigerated. So distribution is our biggest hurdle. But not only that, as a consumer, you have to request it. Yes. Okay. It's Especially because right now there are so many kombucha companies popping up all over the place. A lot of really small companies sort of biting away at shelf space. Um, mm -hmm. It's become a very local beverage for some reason. Like people are Almost very hyper, -local. hyper, yes, a yeah. hyper, hyper local beverage. So that makes it even more competitive. So now all of these companies are taking little small bites at what shelf space is available. Yeah. So ends up being an overall watered down sort of business for everyone. Right. Um, that makes it very, very difficult. So if you are a consumer and you love a certain a certain kombucha, then you yep. have to question in the grocery store, especially the mainstream chains, because they are they are stubborn. They, they yeah. do not want to take on um, local kombucha for some reason. It's, it's, right. it's hard to get into these bigger chains for sure. Yeah, we found it really interesting because the, uh, with the new product with Thrive, the herbal tea, it will be a national brand very quickly. We're already shipping out in two weeks to a 30 store chain in Ontario called Farm Boy. Um, Perfect. Excited about that. It's yeah. going to be really good. Um, and part of it is, of course, because it's shelf stable. So it's a little more you know, doable for us to get those listings. Um, and also it's kind of innovative in that space. But yeah, the kombucha space, it's crazy. Like they have, you know, most mainstream stores now have five or six brands of kombucha. Yeah. And, and like sort of natural hippie health stores could have a dozen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a lot that they're allocating in the shelf space, but even then it sells such tremendous volume. It's so popular right now um, that it only makes sense for them to have that many brands. Yeah. It's a really interesting space to be in and it became competitive very quickly. We've only been at it for just over three, three and a half years now. Yeah. And it changed a lot in that time. Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, like in these natural health food stores, you'll see 12 brands, but in some of the bigger chains, you see two to three brands and mm -hmm. none of them are local. Yeah. 
Yeah, right? So there's definitely so room there's, for more Canadian products. Yeah, there's room for more Canadian products. There's mo- room for more BC-based products, but they just, it's it's a really difficult thing to crack. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so the, the hard reality of starting a drink brand, uh, kombucha, how long does kombucha last on the shelf? What's the shelf life for? Ours is six months from production. Okay. So, I mean, generally it has to be to the distributor with at least three months. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. So, um, but the tea, iced tea world, that's exciting. So whether you're in Ontario or you're in BC, you're going to find it on the shelves in the rest of the country. Just wait, ask for it. If yep. you would like a um, remedy focused tea in your life versus just having the options of iced tea, green tea, et cetera, that you find the typicals. So I, I love that. I, I think it's very true. It's like almost futuristic when you read about these space people in the future who could take a pill when they're feeling anxiety or take a pill. You know, you read about the space food. It's almost like you've made space <laughs> future drinks. If you're feeling a certain emotion, you can grab it off the shelf. And, and that's the irony of it, too, is because you look backwards and these are things that have been used for thousands of years. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a weird thing to be like, oh, try this new product. But yeah, people have been using it for thousands of years. Well, and people ask like, oh, is it safe? Like, can I can I take this? Mm-hmm. Or I'm like, well, why is why are sugar free sodas on the shelf? Yeah, I yeah. mean, why are why is aspartame allowed on our grocery shelves? So ask these hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like you've done almost like what Sage has done. Like Sage has taken these kind of like ancient remedies and ideas. That again, typically you're, you're kind of only your kooky friend would have in these jars in their house to be like, rub this on your face and you your headache will go away. Yes. Exactly. They just branded it, almost similar branding, the kind of brown look, earthy feel, and, yeah. and said, no, rub this on your your face and your headache will go away. But they did it like True. in a beautifully crafted, branded, marketed way. So well, yeah. don't take, yeah, you don't have to take a Tylenol every time you have a headache. Just use this little roller, and and yeah. it actually it does work. I mean, well, and look that's how eager people are to part. try it. Like, look how well they're doing, and look at the growth in that area. People seeking natural remedies. Yeah, uh, there's there's tons of interest in this. Yeah, and we've always we've always kind of practiced what we preach, and we've found that interesting for years, and we we love it. So we're yeah, it's super oh, cool yeah. that we can incorporate I look for that products. into our work. Yeah, I look for products like the ones we're making. Mm-hmm. Just it's exciting and something to be proud of. Mm-hmm. All right. So to wrap it up. Who do I find in a grocery store? Should I find the guy stocking the shelves or who do I talk to to request your products in my grocery store? You can do it online. Okay. Um, Email. You can, you can do it online. You can all see it. Yeah. You go into the grocery store, ask for the grocery manager. Yeah. Generally just any manager. Yeah. Okay. Put in a request. Yeah. It does so much. It is unbelievable. Wow. Um, I am a big fan. It, it really is a, a huge joy to have you on the show. And thank you so much for sharing about, about how your company started, some tips, the hard realities of it, <laughs> um, the noise of it. And, um, and I think you gave some hope as well, the fact that there's some hope for the future and there's some hope for some amazing brands coming into stores uh, right across our gate country. So congrats on, on launching a second drink. Um, uh, I'm sure it's going to do very, very well, and and people are going to fall in love with that as you have taken something from the past and made future food for our great. <laughs> We're basically astronauts. <laughs> right. Thanks for yeah, coming up. Thanks, so for having us. <laughs> guys. thanks. Bye. Thanks. thanks for joining us this week on Marketing Jam, and we'll see you next week on The Jam.